that father you're bringing your people to this place in safe passage thank you lord god that father you alone are healing your people tonight you alone will show yourself strong tonight and mighty father only your name will be exalted tonight in all that takes place lord god you are the author and perfecter of our faith lord jesus we recognize your sovereignty and we say lord we decrease that you may increase mighty god putting away our ego putting away everything that we hold high mighty god that lord only you may be magnified thank you mighty father for your presence lord god be exalted tonight be magnified tonight thank you jesus father we give you the praise and we give you the glory because you are worthy of all the praise worthy of all the glory thank you for your goodness thank you for your mercy thank you for your love for those words just together.
worship you, we worship you, we worship you, we worship you, we worship you, oh, we worship you, Lord, we worship you, we worship you, Lord, we worship you, we worship you. You are, you are, 
of the Lord speak to you tonight. Hallelujah. Let your miracle start now. The fruition of your miracle start now. Just love the Lord. Just open your mouth and say something to the Lord. Interact with the Holy Spirit tonight. Yes, oh God, I'm ocean. to worship you. 
worship you. I worship you. tonight we worship you on the sixth evening of our prayer and just pour our hearts let's connect to the throne of Jesus the mighty presence of the Lord which is here let's penetrate into our hearts our minds oh oh Dura Raga Every burden we carry, the power and the presence of God must melt it tonight. Oh, the territorial forces which is controlling the Kanini must be broken tonight under the heavy presence of Jesus as we worship. As Apostle Paul and Silas worshipped in the light, the foundations were shaken. Tonight, the foundations must shake. The power of God must manifest. Chains must loosen. Doors must flow open. Lives must be changed. Light must be released. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Father. Father, on the sixth evening of our prayer and fasting, we come before you. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for your presence. Thank you, Lord. From the day one, O oh God, you stood with us. Wherever you are, you are able to touch somebody, just to touch someone. Father, on the sixth evening of this prayer and fasting, agreeing together, holding your hands in agreement, we declare, O oh God, as we stand firm in Christ for our supernatural victories, victory means there are battles. But our victory is not natural, it is supernatural. So Father, on the sixth day, six is the day of rest. We declare victory supernaturally upon us, O prayer. And every agenda, every plan, the devil and the team still continue having against us, O prayer, that we will not successfully complete the seven days of prayer and fasting. Tonight we paralyze it. We cancel death, we cancel accidents, we cancel sicknesses, confusion, division, conflict, any form of engaging evil forces, any kind of evil altars that has been sent, or spoken, a covenant has made, any uh, Lord enchanting has been done against house of prayer or any house of prayer people or the territory. Tonight we break it in the name of Jesus. Every evil covenant in the Lord have been broken. Our, your people in house of prayer shall victoriously complete the seven days of prayer and fasting. The light has released. Father Kanini is saved. Kanini is delivered. Foundation has been revealed. Broken, oh Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Tonight, we are ready to receive from you. Speak to us, O oh God. Anoint your servant. Let him minister under open heaven, O oh God. Thank you. If there is a spirit of oppression or wandering mind or confusion here, we arrest it in the name of Jesus. We loosen the Holy Spirit upon Kanini. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord. We give all the glory and honor unto you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen and amen and amen. Praise the Lord and good evening, church. Please take us. Praise the Lord. The Lord is good all the time. And that is His. Can we give a round of applause to appreciate our awesome God, our loving God? On the sixth evening of our prayer and fasting, the Lord has brought us here. Hallelujah. You all look strong, glorious, awesome with the presence of God. As the man of God spoke last night, 
a time of new season. Hallelujah. Also pray, receive it in the name of Jesus. I receive my new season. I pray all of us shall receive our new things. A new beginning, new blessing, new strength, new healing. Hallelujah. Spiritually, numerically, financially, territorially, as a house of prayer, we shall see the new season. Amen. Thank you. Hallelujah. As we are there, just wave to somebody and say, my neighbor, you look strong and well. Hallelujah. May God bless you. May God bless you. I do not want to waste time so that the man, we are here to hear from the word. Hallelujah. Are you ready to receive the word? Are we ready? Prophet, we are blessed. Uh, prophet, we are blessed. Hallelujah. Let's put our hands together. Welcome, Prophet Roger Skalinde to come and minister. Amen. Praise the Lord. Good evening, everyone. Greetings in the name of Jesus. Let us pray. Father, we worship you. We honor you. We humble ourselves before you. This evening, we thank you for the journey of these seven days prayer and fasting. We thank you for the mighty things you have done thus far. And we thank you, mighty God, as we head towards perfection. The seventh day tomorrow. This evening, may you set us on your platform. And may you, mighty God, may you equip us. May you quicken us by the breath of your spirit, opening our eyes. Mighty God, that we may see in the spirit and the wonderful things out of the pages of scripture. We give you all the praise, Holy Spirit. We welcome you, acknowledge you. May you release your unction, your breath upon the ministry of your word. Touch every life. You sent your word and he healed our diseases and delivered us from our distractions. As your word comes, may you locate those that need healing, those that need deliverance in any place and form of affliction by the power of your light and the counsel of your word. And we vow to give you all the glory for everything you do in the power of name of Jesus, we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Praise the Lord. How men are blessed to be in the house this evening. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor Ryan Son. Thank you, the leadership of this church. We bless the Lord for what he's doing. I want us to come to the book of First Peter this evening. The past two nights we've looked at as we are dealing with the theme standing firm in Christ for supernatural victories. And we looked at Deuteronomy chapter 20, the last two nights. And we have looked at how to understand the laws of warfare. And tonight, we are going to go a step further and look at how to stand firm in Christ. There's something so powerful about standing firm in Christ Jesus. And First uh, Peter chapter 5 verse 6 to 11. The Bible declares, humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God that he may exhort you in due time, casting all your care upon him for he careth Be sober, be vigilant because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. But the God of all grace, who has called us unto eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Now look at what he says at verse 10. The God of all grace. We serve the God of all grace. That means that grace is multifaceted. The Bible calls it the manifold grace. And so he's the God of grace. There's grace for salvation. There's grace for healing. There's grace for sanctification. To say no to ungodliness. There's grace for prayer. There is grace for prosperity. There's grace for revelation. One dimension after another in the things of the, of the Lord. There is 
multifaceted grace. And the God we serve is the God of all grace. The Bible says that after you have suffered a while, he will make you perfect. He will establish you. He will strengthen you and he will settle you. So suffering is not forever. After you have suffered a while, God allows certain things to come. The Bible says, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. When your faith and mind is under trial, the Bible says there's something it is working out. There's a capacity it is building. And so when trials and temptations come, don't be sad, don't be low, don't be discouraged. Count it all joy. Because there's a greater purpose God Almighty is working in the midst of the storms that are coming against you. Count it all joy. The suffering is not forever. After you have suffered a while, it will bring you to a place of being established, being perfected, being strengthened, and being settled. Is the God of all grace. In Isaiah, the Bible says, the people that were spared in the wilderness found grace. And amazingly, that type of grace, they found it in the wilderness. There is grace you tap in the wilderness season of your life that you will not find in Canaan in the land flowing with milk and honey. So in the midst of storms and trouble, do not spare them. Tap all the grace you need to tap. Because God Almighty is taking you somewhere to be established, to be perfected, and he wants you strengthened so you can flourish. Now the theme is standing firm in Christ for supernatural victories. We've looked at how to attain supernatural victories by understanding the laws of warfare, but there's something about standing firm that I want us to address. Standing firm. Well, when you read in Ephesians chapter 6, the Bible says... Uh, at verse 10, finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Be strong in the Lord. And he says, take unto you, put on the full armor of God that you may be able to withstand against the wiles of the devil in the evil day, all the fiery darts of the wicked. And he says, take on the belt of, of truth. Your loins get about with truth, the breastplate of righteousness. Your feet showed with the preparation of the gospel of peace and the, the shield of faith to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, the helmet of salvation. And the Bible says, stand therefore, having done all to stand. There is something about standing. When you stand firm in Christ, you attain a certain position that affect certain conditions around you. This is why in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 6 verse 33, Jesus says, the Gentiles seek after certain things, but there's a position they have not attained. How, what they shall eat, wherewith they shall be clothed. But he says, but for you, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That is a position, that is a stand. Then all these things shall be added unto you. When you stand firm in Christ, there are certain things that you attract, things that are added unto you and I. And this is what we need to understand concerning standing. We're going to look at some keys from our text here. How is it, how can we stand firm in Christ? There are certain things the Apostle Peter brings out that will cause you and I to stand strong, to be unwavering. Even when the suffering comes, a while storms come and challenges come, we must remain standing. And at verse 6, he gives us the first key. We're going to look at about five keys. Number one, he says, Humble yourself, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exhort you in due time. Key number one, humble yourself. Humble yourself. And every condition and key he gives is attached to certain benefits. He says, humble yourself therefore under the mighty hand of God. Why? That he may exhort you in due time. So the end game from God is to exhort you. But the condition and position from you and I is to humble ourselves. 
because God finds it difficult to, to exhort somebody that has already exhorted themselves. The Bible says, those that exhort themselves, God abases them. He resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Every time we humble ourselves, we attract grace from the God who lifts in due season. You are attracting exhortation and lifting. Every time you humble yourself, under the mighty hand of God, under his rulership, under the influence of his spirit and the counsel of his word, that he may exhort you in due time. There is what is known as due time. This is the opportune time, the appointed time for your elevation. But when he comes to exhort you, will he find you in the position that he wants, that propels him to lift you in that particular season? And here, he doesn't say, we should pray, oh Lord, humble me. The Bible is clear. It simply says, humble yourself. It's a personal responsibility for me to recognize that I can't do anything without him. Humbleness means total dependency on God. Refusing to do things outside his ability. If I think that my own intelligence can make things work, then I am not humbling myself. To begin with, the intelligence came from him. But even with that gift and grace, he wants me still to look to him for ability to be where I'm supposed to be. And so it is our personal responsibility to acknowledge that without him we are nothing. So the Bible says, humble yourself. And let me tell you that you know, when we talk about being humble and humility, as, as powerful a virtue and a trait as it is, sometimes it is misunderstood, completely misunderstood. In fact, you can think you are humble until you are tested. Just like you can think you have faith until your faith is under trial. So anything that is not tested can't really be trusted. So faith will be tested in order to be trusted. This is why the Bible says, the trial of your faith worketh patience. It produces something. It is tested in order to be proven that it can take you somewhere. So anything that is not tested cannot be trusted. Love that is not tested cannot be trusted. Humbleness that has not been tested, we can't even call it humbleness. So sometimes, because we lack something, we look humble. Sometimes because we are hungry, we look humble. Sometimes because we have no money, we look humble. And so when a little money comes, what has been dormant on the inside is amplified. And you think that money is evil. No, there was something hidden on the inside. There was no humility and submission before God. And when the money came, it just amplified the ego and the pomp. So pride began to manifest and to talk. Even now we walk changes. We have no time for God. There are certain people we don't even respect anymore because it was a giant that was already just dormant on the inside. There is no humility. So sometimes a blessing will come just to see, to test whether we are really humble. There's an example in the book of Daniel of a king, the king of Babylon called Nebuchadnezzar. And the Bible says he dreamt a dream. The king, he was a great king. Babylon was a great kingdom. And in his dream, he saw a big tree. The Bible says the tree was so gigantic. The trunk was huge and the branches were big and, and they, they were fruits and they were, the fowls of the air found their nests there. The beasts of the field found a shelter and shade under that great tree. And he was seeing it in his dream. And then he says he heard a voice saying, Cut down the tree, shake off the branches, let all the birds fly away, but leave the stump chained to the ground. And he woke up. And it troubled him because he didn't understand what it meant. He, he called for the magicians and the wise men of Babylon and he told them the dream they could not understand or even interpret what it meant until Daniel was brought in. And Daniel told the king, the, the dream, O king, is that that tree is you. You are the one that has become so great. The God of heaven has given you glory and might in the kingdom of Babylon. But there is but one problem. You have, you have become proud and pomp has been found in your heart. This dream has come to warn you so that you can repent of your pride and humble yourself before the God of heaven because he's the one who gives greatness. 
If you do that, it will be a prolonging of your tranquility in the kingdom. But if you do not be sure, the tree will be cut. He was given a window of 12 months. The Bible says in the 12th month after the interpretation of the dream, he rises and goes up the balcony of his palace. And he began to overlook the entire kingdom from a paranormal view, the north, the south, the west, and the east. And he saw the, the richness and the wealth of Babylon. And then in his heart, pride spoke. And he said, this is great Babylon, which I have built for my glory. Bible says as the words were coming out of his mouth, a voice from heaven spoke and said the kingdom is taken away from you and the, your, the heart of man will be taken away from you. You'll be given the heart of an animal and you will live like a madman until seven years passes over you. Until you learn that the almighty God ruleth over the kingdoms of men and he gives it to whomsoever he wills. Power and greatness comes from God. Whatever it is you have comes from God. He is the source of every good and perfect thing. I can't possess any wisdom unless God has given it. A man can receive nothing except it be given him from above. If you have an anointing, it came from above. If you are gifted, the gift is from above. If you have a powerful voice, it came from above. If you have wealth, it is God who gave it. If you have authority and power, it came from the Lord. And Nebuchadnezzar forgot because of pride. The Bible says immediately he lost human understanding. And he left the palace, ran into the bush like a madman. Until seven years passed over him, the Bible says the hair was not cut and his nails were never trimmed until they grew like talons of an eagle and his hair like feathers of a bird and he was eating grass for seven years. After seven years, he says, then my understanding returned. And then he says, this God of heaven, there is no one like him. While he was in a state of madness, at least physically. And he says he is the one who exhorts. And all rulership comes from him. He rules over the kingdoms of men in heaven and on earth. And anyone who exhorts himself is able to abase them or to humble them. And he returned to the palace in that state. But now he returned praising the God of heaven and not himself. When the Bible says humble yourself, you and I are being spared from being humbled by God. Because when God humbles you seven years like Nebuchadnezzar is what could come your way. The Bible says humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. No matter what you attend, no matter what God gives you. No matter the breakthrough, the miracle, humble yourself. When you are shining high, humble yourself. When you are flying high, humble yourself. When you break through, humble yourself. When God uses you mightily, humble yourself. Whatever enlargement comes your way, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. And as you continually humble yourself, he also continually exhorts you. Because every time we humble ourselves, we attract exhortation. That he may exhort you in due time. When we attain this virtue, do you know what happens? It, it reduces frictions even in relationships. Why there are a lot of problems and conflicts and strife in relationships is the absence of humbleness. The Bible says, submit yourselves one to another and preferring your neighbor more than yourself. That's what humbleness is all about. And you see, relationships are treasures. These are resources God has given us. And without the virtue of humility, we can destroy certain relationships. In the body of Christ, in the family, in the communities we live. Humility is a must. And if God is going to take you places, you must be humble before him. John the Baptist understood. So did Jesus. When they met at the, at the Jordan for baptism, when John looked at Jesus, he looked at him from a prophetic perspective. And you must understand, according to Bible records, the first meeting between John and Jesus, they were both in their mother's womb. Elizabeth, John. 
and marry Jesus. And the Bible says when, 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 when Mary entered the house of Elizabeth and greeted her, the baby John the Baptist in the womb of Elizabeth leaped for joy and was filled with the Holy Ghost. And after that they parted. John was born and three months later Jesus was born. And you know from that moment they, there is no record of them meeting until at the Jordan. Because John lived in the wilderness. The path of his destiny and ministry was that of a Nazarite that was separated and secluded from the community so he can be hearing the voice of God. This is why Isaiah prophesied concerning him, saying the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight his paths for his glory to manifest. And so he says, the one who sent me told me, upon whom you shall see the spirit descending in bodily form like a dove, he is the one. He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And when John looked at Jesus, he actually knew that this man is greater than me. And he says to him, I have need to be baptized by you. Everybody else have baptized, but you are the one who should baptize me. And Jesus says, I know it is true, but for now, we must fulfill all righteousness. So allow me to be baptized by you. That was the humbleness on the part of the Messiah. He knows that this man, he is born because of me. He is a voice to prepare the way for me. He's a forerunner for me. But all righteousness must be fulfilled in the law of submission. He humbles himself and he is baptized. The Bible says from there he's led by the Spirit into the wilderness. We all know when he returned, all Jerusalem followed Jesus. Even those that were following John the Baptist and his ministry for some years, they all left and followed Jesus. The disciples of John were, you know, unsettled when they saw what was happening. And they said to John, but the man you testify of, all Jerusalem has come unto him. He's baptizing on the other side of the Jordan and everybody's flocking there. In John chapter 3. This a response that John the Baptist gives, that gives insight. At verse 27, John answered and said, A man cannot receive anything except it be given him from above. You yourselves are testifying that I said that he is the one. Therefore he must increase, I must decrease. John also submitted himself to the greatness of Christ Jesus. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that he may exhort you in due time and now that we have entered a new season let us humble ourselves before God do you know why some people can't say I'm sorry to somebody they have wronged it is pride it is pride before God why some people will not repent and confess it is pride and God already knows what is going on in our hearts why hide might as well just open and bear our souls before him and tell him, search me and remove whatever you don't like in me. I humble myself. Don't wait for him to humble you. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. That will cause you to stand. You know what Paul says? He says, take heed. Every man that thinks he's standing, let him take heed lest he fall. Because the one that makes us to stand is God. It is his ability and his grace that causes us to stand firm. So storms can come and they can rock your boat and your ship. You will still survive it because you have humbled yourself under the mighty hand of God. May that grace be your portion. Total dependency on Almighty God. Key number two is prayer. Key number two is prayer. At verse 7 of 1 Peter chapter 5, the Bible says, Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. How do you cast your cares, your burdens upon the Lord? It is through prayer. Whatever burden you are carrying, don't think you will handle it alone. If you are going through grief, submit your grief unto God. Don't carry it alone. If you are discouraged, come into the presence of Almighty God and cast your burden before him. If you are stressed, don't handle your stress alone. Take it in prayer unto God. If you have questions, there's something you are searching, you are in any kind of need, take it to the Lord in prayer. You and I will not be able to stand if we don't pray. When the storms of life come, what will keep us standing is prayer. 
So be a man of prayer. Be a woman of prayer. You can be young but prayerful. You can be advanced in age but still prayerful. God Almighty is attracted to people that pray. The Bible says draw near unto God and he will draw near unto you. Call unto me and I will answer you and I will show you great and mighty things that you do not know. Men ought always to pray and not to faint. Always to pray. In Luke chapter 18 and 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, the Bible says, pray without ceasing. Pray in the morning, pray at noon, pray in the night. Wake up in the wee hours of the night and pray. And until your spirit is conditioned in a perpetual state of prayer, so that even when you are sleeping, your spirit is in prayer. It is active and it is alert. Pray without ceasing. If you and I are going to stand, we have got to cultivate the culture of prayer and not faint. Pray without ceasing. Pray before you make decisions. Pray when you wake up. Pray before you sleep. Even before you eat, pray. You are acknowledging that God has provided. Don't just get food and start eating. Some people have died because of food. It can go in a wrong place. Your, your anatomy is very complicated. It is God who created it. He knows where the windpipe is. He knows where the, the, the tube that takes food to your, to your intestines and stomach. Uh, and it is possible to choke on food. It is possible to choke on water or saliva. Every time you are saying, Lord, thank you for this meal, and you, you speak grace, you, you are acknowledging him as provider, but also acknowledging that he's keeping you health and sustaining you through the food he has provided. So we pray all the time so that we stand firm in Christ Jesus. Key number three at verse eight. The Bible says, be sober, be vigilant. Key number three, if you are going to stand firm in Christ, be sober and be vigilant. To be sober, it means the mind is balanced, it is sound. It is not a wandering mind. Did you know one of the targets the devil has against a believer, against a person, it is the mind. Because as a man thinketh, so is he. If you have a wandering mind, you cannot be stable. In the book of James chapter 1 verse 5 to 8, the Bible says, if any man lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives liberally and abradeth not. But let him ask in faith nothing wavering. For any man that wavereth is like the wave of the sea, tossed to and fro and is unstable. Let not such a man think that he shall receive anything from the Lord. They say it says, for a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. So be sober. Possess sobriety of mind. Because as your mind goes, so your life goes. As a man thinketh, so is he. And the enemy will shoot darts at your mind. Evil thoughts. All kind of de defeated thoughts. Thoughts that are sad. Thoughts of failure. Thoughts of doubt. He will defeat you by targeting your mind. So you have to be stable in your mind. Be sober. And be vigilant. To be vigilant is to be alert. You know that there is an enemy out there. Don't live life as if there is no enemy. This is why, look at what, let's finish verse 8. Look at verse 8. Be sober, be vigilant. Why? Because your adversary, it is connected to your enemy. Adversary is an opposer, an enemy. As a rolling lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. So if your mind is not sober, he can devour you. If you are not vigilant and alert, the enemy is seeking for a weak link. Why is a lion used here as an example? Your adversary as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. See, lions are predators out there in the world. And they can hunt anything because the lion believes it's the king of the jungle. Even an elephant it goes for, even a giraffe. But there are certain animals that are not easy to bring down. And so the lion being the leader that he is, there is a certain way he intimidates by roaring. When he roars, he creates panic. Among the animals. Then the lionesses, they take position to go. They, they are the ones that do most of the hunting, the lionesses. But the leader, the lion, rose to cause panic. So that the, it can 
divide and separate some weak ones from the entire horde. Those huge buffaloes, they've got some small buffalo children that, that they have. And, and so if the lion roars, they can separate them. And then the lioness says, we'll go for the weak one. Like a roaring lion, he walketh about seeking whom he may devour. And if you are not sober, you are not vigilant, you'll be separated from the fold. The team of believers that is strong when they are united. And the enemy, when he wants to take you down, he begins to discourage you from the fellowship. He discourages you from attending church. He discourages you from the word and from connecting with believers. So he weakens you. Then the final blow comes and he goes for the jugular, you are gone. You become meat for the enemy. But when you are sober and vigilant, you are in the way, you are in prayer, you are in fellowship. When there's a moment to gather with believers, you are there. And even what you could not do alone, when you come in the place where believers are praying together, the fire rubs off on you. As you walk back home, you are empowered, you are energized, and you are able to move on the whole week because of the power of unity. Be sober, be vigilant. There are thoughts you must not permit in your head. You have heard the saying, you cannot keep a bed from flying over your head, but you can sure keep it from building a nest. There are thoughts you resist in your mind by the power of sobriety. You refuse to think like you are defeated. You are not a weakling. You are not a loser. You are the head and not the tail. You are above only and not beneath. And this is the biggest trouble God had with the children of Israel. When he brought them out of Egypt, it was their mindset. You know, being slaves for over 400 years in Egypt really messed them up mentally. And so God would tell them about possessing a land flowing with milk and honey. I, I know they kept saying the, the Anakites are giants. The, the land swallows up its own inhabitants. The spies that went into, into Canaan to spy the land in Numbers 13 and 14. When they brought a report, you should see their mindset. Moses told them, go search out the land. See if the land is vast. See if it is fortified. See the kind of trees that are there. And if they are fruits, bring some of the fruits of that land. So we can see where we are going. 40 days, they walked around Canaan and they came back with a report. And they even brought back some, some fruits. And they said the land, we went to spy 12 spies. One from every tribe of the 12 tribes of Israel. And the land is vast and, and the, the land is, is fruitful. And we have brought back some of the fruits here. They should have ended there and put a full stop. But then they said, nevertheless. After giving a good report, they said, nevertheless. The land is not good. It swallows up its own inhabitants. If we go there, we will be swallowed. And the men of that land are of great stature. We can't fight them. The children of the, of the Anakites, the giants, are in that land. They dwell in the south. We cannot go in and possess the land. God says go in, possess them. Their own heads are saying we can't go in. And then they make an amazing statement at the end. They said we looked in our own sight like grasshoppers. And so we looked in their sight. How they saw themselves is how the opponents saw them. We looked in our own sight as grasshoppers. So did we look in their sight. How you see yourself in your mind is how your opponents and your enemy will see you. Be sober, be vigilant. You can be small in stature but big in your thinking because your God is a great God. This is why I kept telling them, you are the head and not the tail. You are the righteousness of God. There is no condemnation in you. You are above only and not beneath. Be sober, be vigilant. There is an enemy out there. If you are not sober, he will catch you. So key number three is be sober, be vigilant. Key number four. At verse 9 and 10. When he talks about the adversary walking around like a rolling lion at verse 9, he says, Whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. But the God of all grace, who has called you unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that you have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. 
Key number four, resist the devil steadfastly. The Bible says resist him steadfast in the faith. God won't resist him for you. He has given you the authority to resist him on your own in the faith. And you need sometimes to confess it and declare, devil, you, a li you are a liar. I resist and rebuke you over my family. I rebuke you over my ministry. I rebuke you over my children. I rebuke you over my family. I rebuke you out of my mind. You have been given power and authority. When Jesus called the 72, the Bible says he sent them into the villages that he would come himself, but he gave them authority, exosia, power to exercise authority. He says, cast out devils, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, heal the sick. He gave them power against unclean spirits. When they returned, they came to him to give a report and they said, Lord, even the demons are subject unto us in your name. And Jesus says, I behold Satan, I beheld Satan fall like a lightning. Behold, I've given unto you power to tread on snakes and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall harm you. Now you notice he said that before he even went to the cross. Before the new covenant was introduced. This authority they operated under during the law and not during grace. But after he died, was buried and rose from the dead. He comes and appears. He says, all power in heaven and on earth has been given unto me. Go ye therefore. Go ye therefore means I delegate it to you. This power in heaven and on earth which is given to me, I have now given it to you on a great commission. Go preaching whoever believes and is baptized shall be saved and this sign shall follow those that believe. In my name they shall speak in new tongues. They shall cast out devils and they shall lay hands on the sick and the sick shall recover. If they drink anything deadly it shall not harm them. They shall take up serpents and they shall not be harmed. That is authority and power. Resist the devil with that authority. Don't let him get too familiar with you. You have power as a believer. And you must exercise that authority. Your mouth must speak authoritatively over the situations and conditions that the adversary is opposing in your life. Resist the devil and he will flee. If you don't resist him, he will stay. Resist him steadfastly and he will flee. Notice the approach in resisting is, is not a weak resisting. Resist him steadfast in the faith. And he will flee. We have power to resist the devil. You have power to resist the enemy. He cannot intimidate you and I. It doesn't matter the size of your problem. You have authority to resist the devil. The Bible says, though we walk in the flesh, we do not wage war after the flesh. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They are mighty through God. To the pulling down of strongholds, casting down evil imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. We have power to bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. We have deadly weapons against this devil. And he knows you and I must know it and we must exercise authority. If you are going to stand firm in Christ, you must know you have an enemy called the devil and the Bible says resist him. Resist the devil. Do you know that God can heal you and then the devil can begin to talk to your mind to say, are you sure you are healed? And then the symptoms can begin to creep in. You have to exercise authority. I resist you, devil, you are a liar. I am healed, I am washed in the blood, I am victorious. The spirit that raised Jesus from the dead has quickened my mortal body. Resist the devil. You will not stand if you don't resist him. When Jesus was in the boat, as I close, you know, they were going to the gatherings across the Galilee, Sea of Galilee. The Bible says, because you know, he used to pray a lot in the night. He was tired, sleeping in the hinder part of the boat on a pillow. And then there was a storm. The storm began to rock the boat. And water waves were coming, spilling into the boat. The disciples were struggling to remove the water. And they feared that they would sink. 
They are struggling and Jesus is there. It's amazing how he can be in your boat and you are using your own ability to keep the boat afloat. Then all of a sudden they realize, but the master is here. So they went to wake him up. And they said, Master, care is not thou that we perish. When Jesus woke up, the Bible says he first rebuked them before he talked to the sea. Wherefore did you fear, O ye of little faith? Why? And then he turned to the storm, to the storm and he said, Peace be still. He rebuked the wind and the wind ceased. Immediately there was a great calm. Then the disciples looked at him and they said, What manner of man is this? That even the winds and the seas obey him. He was a man of authority. He remains a man of authority. That same authority has given to you and I. And what he is doing, we are exercising that authority so we stand firm in Christ. We are resisting the devil. You see, there's something that happens when you see this authority in operation and functional in your life. It builds your faith. It causes you to grow. These words in the pages of scripture are not for decorations. They are real. This is not a novel. This is the authority. He has exalted his word above all his name. The word of God is forever settled in heaven. It was written by several writers over a period like of, of 1,000 years between the Old and the New Testament. Over 40 people that wrote. And you will find some things Isaiah wrote over 500 years later. Paul confirms or Peter confirms by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says all scripture is given by inspiration of the Holy Spirit and it is profitable for doctrine, for teaching, for reproof that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped, rightly dividing the word of truth, interpreting it rightly and applying it rightly so it can produce results. That is the tool God Almighty has given us. It is alive. The Bible says in Hebrews, the word of God is quick. The word quick means alive. Sharper than any two-edged sword. Piercing to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. It means it searches our inner beings. Nothing is hidden from him. The Bible says it is, is the discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. And all things are manifest before him with whom we have to do. This word of God will cause you to stand strong and firm in Christ. Everything he has spoken, he shall fulfill and bring it to pass in your life. Standing firm in Christ Jesus. Once we take that position of standing, it doesn't matter the storm that comes. We will remain standing and we will emerge victorious. Because that's the position God Almighty has given us. And it's time for you to begin to declare that you are standing. On personal and individual level that you are standing. As a corporate body of Christ in house of prayer, we declare that we are standing. On what almighty God has spoken. You see, even when we approach him in prayer, we have God says, bring your causes unto me. Let us reason together. Bring your strong argument. What is he talking about? He's not talking about us arguing emotionally. He's saying, bring what I have said to you. And bring me to remembrance. This is why we said to him, this is what your word says. This is what we believe. This is what we are standing on in prayer. If we are sick, you said we shall be healed. By your stripes we are healed. If we are lacking in some places, he said he would provide because he is Jehovah Jireh, our provider. We stand firm on what he has spoken. And the enemy stands no chance in your life and mine. Stand to your feet, close your Bible. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Makaya Baya. Lift up your hands to him. Father, we worship you. We humble ourselves before you. Oh God, we give you thanks. We give you glory for your grace. We choose to be sober. And we come in prayer. We resist the enemy. We pray your ability and your grace to be manifest in our lives to the glory of your wonderful and matchless name. 
May you empower us to stand firm. In the mighty name of Jesus, the Son of the living God. I want you to begin to pray. Lord, cause me to stand. I humble myself before you. Just bring yourself before him in prayer quickly in the next few minutes. We give you thanks. We give you praise. We give you glory. Blessed Holy Spirit, we seek you. We desire you. We call upon you. May you cause us to rise as we wait upon you. Oh, you have declared. Mighty God, they that wait upon the Lord shall remain strength shall mount up with wings like eagles shall run and not be weary walk and not faint in your presence wonderful lord we wait we approach you in these seven days of prayer and fasting to wait upon you that you will renew our strength quicken and empower us to rise and so that we will stand firm in christ jesus and every promise that you have given us will be manifest to the glory of your blessed name. Mayatabaya. Hele bakaya. Quicken us to pray by your breath, by your spirit. Empower us, mighty God, to so high above every storm. We choose to have a sober mind. We choose to be vigilant. Renew our minds by the power of your counsel and the power of your word and the inspiration of the blessed Holy Spirit. May you touch each and every one of us. May your mighty God cover and envelop us in the covet of your wings that we will dwell in the secret place place of the most high and abide under the shadow of the almighty and say of the Lord he is my refuge and my fortress my God in him will I trust surely shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence a thousand shall fall at our side and ten thousand at our right hand but it shall not come near us only with our eyes we shall behold and see the reward of the wicked we choose to abide and tarry in the secret place of the most high under your wings under the shadow of your wings hebaya vaye hebaya kadaba whoa glory to your holy name lubaya viheshta thank you jesus as your hands are lifted, there's someone here. You have been struggling in your dream. It's like there's something pursuing you. You seem to be fighting with things you are not very clear of. Sometimes it's like a human being or just a force. And you want to shout Jesus. Let you feel like you are frozen. It's, it's an attack on your life. It's from some evil altar of witchcraft. And tonight, the Lord is setting you free. Just quickly walk to the front. Any struggle in your dreams, you're about to break into a dimension and a realm of victory, and the enemies are flicking your life in dreams. Just walk to the front, lift up your hands. You know, dreams sometimes are an encounter. Some people get sick because they are attacked in dreams, it's an encounter. Your spirit is alert in the realm of the spirit. It is translated through a dream. By the authority of the name of Jesus, I pray for you now. And I come against every evil altar of witchcraft. Working against your life. Every pursuer of your destiny and your life through dreams. I rebuke those powers now. I set those evil orders on fire. And I command those evil powers to lose your life by the power and authority of Almighty God. We resist the enemy now. I resist those evil orders now. I command those evil powers. Lose the people of God and let them go in the mighty name of Jesus. I declare victory upon your life from every onslaught of the adversary be set free now in the powerful name of Jesus the anointing of the spirit of almighty God to touch you now I rebuke every attack <sighs> mighty name of Jesus <sighs> I rebuke every attack <sighs> I rebuke every attack loose and let her go mighty name of Jesus loose and let her go down Mighty name of Jesus. 
Loose, let her go. Loose, let her go. Mighty name of Jesus. Loose her now. Go. Mighty name of Jesus. Release her now. In the mighty name of Jesus. Come on, lift up your hands. Pray in the spirit. Father, we declare victory in the mighty name of Jesus. Whatever adversary is working against your life, in your spiritual life, in your finances, in your ministry, your calling, we resist the devil now. We come against every onslaught of the enemy by the power of Almighty God. Whatever is assigned to unsettle you, to cause you to be a wanderer, we resist it by the power and authority of Almighty God. Yes, Lord. Somebody, your eyes, something has been happening to your eyes. Sometimes they are itchy. Sometimes you see like you become blurry. Like your vision becomes blurry. God Almighty wants to touch you now. I want you to place your hand on your eyes, right? Wherever you are. In the mighty name of Jesus, I rebuke that affliction. Thank you, Lord. Oh, Father, your touch upon those eyes there is even somebody watching that is following god is touching you right where you are those eyes put your your hands on your eyes i rebuke that affliction in the powerful name of jesus the itchiness to go the blurry vision to go may you see clearly in the mighty name of jesus your nerves and every aspect and part of your eyes to be touched by the power of Almighty God. Be set free. In the name of Jesus. Somebody, like your abdomen, there's some pain that you, you experience. Sometimes it is sharp, especially on the side. On the side. I want you to put your hand right there. You will not undergo any operation. Because what, what I am seeing is, where things become really bad, like they have to cut you up. But the Lord says, no, we resist the devil over your health. We resist the adversary. In the powerful name of Jesus, loose and set them free. In the blessed name of Jesus. Glory to God. There is something God will intensify as we gather tomorrow morning here. He will heal the sick. He will deliver the bound. And there will be breakthrough in your life as we come to the final day of prayer and fasting. You have anyone sick at home like Pastor mentioned yesterday, bring them. You have somebody backslidden, bring them so they can come back to the Lord. And begin to fly high in that which God Almighty has ordained. It's going to be an explosive and powerful moment. Let us welcome Pastor. Thank you. God bless you. Hallelujah. Please take your seat. Thank you. Hallelujah. The Lord is good. Thank you. Ashes, two ashes quickly. Hallelujah. On the sixth evening of our prayer and fasting, if you have come with a tithe and offering, I have an opportunity to give. Thank you, prophet of God. Thank you for that. Thank you, church, for making it possible all six evening. You have been here. May God bless you. May the Lord bless you. Tomorrow, we will have the Holy Communion. And we will break the fast with the Holy Communion. Please, be here sharp nine. We will start sharp so that the man of God has also enough time. And we have the Holy Communion. As I announced, after the service, we will remain here. Any of you need a special prayer? Please, we will allow you to come. We are not rushing. We are here until prayed for everyone. So bring someone who is in need. Whatever capacity they are in need, bring them. We shall pray for them as the man of God said. God, is prepared. God has prepared a greater thing for us tomorrow. Shall we all stand? Thank you, Pastor. Once again, thank you so much. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. As our shirts are passed by. Lord has given to you, drop it. After dropping, just close to rise, continue connecting to the word of God. Hallelujah. Standing firm. Hallelujah. In Christ's keys. Hallelujah. The man of God has released. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. House of prayer.
our victory is guaranteed. House of prayer, victory is guaranteed. House of prayer, your supernatural victory is guaranteed. Hallelujah. Ruda Raja Galagada Kamanaga Ramba Baud. Lagada Rakabara, Sakabala, Garuda Dida, Rajala Gada Rode. Whatever battle individually and family wise and ministry wise and career wise you have been fighting and going through tonight, the good news is victory is guaranteed. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Be humble. Be vigilant. Hallelujah. Be alert. Be self control. Be prayerful. Hallelujah. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Father, we thank you for tonight. Thank you for tonight. Thank you for the word that has released tonight. We receive it. We receive it. Thank you for the healing. Thank you for the restoration. Thank you for the miracles. The word which you have precisely spoke to house of prayer. Thank you. Continue to use your servant. Lord, we pray for any house of prayer family. Tomorrow, Lord, the devil will not use any trick so that they will stay at home. Anyone sick, you are already healed. There is anyone who don't have a finances supernaturally, you are providing. Thank you, Lord. And along with the house of prayer family, you are bringing many, many new people to the sanctuary so that we shall celebrate and rejoice. Thank you for the sacrificial giving of your people. Bless our God. Tonight, cover us under your mighty wing. Bring us tomorrow, O God. Thank you, Lord. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forever. Amen and amen. May God bless you richly. See you tomorrow. Sharp nine. Bring someone to uh, worship in the Lord. See you, Pastor. Thank you so much. As you drive, somebody need a lift. Give somebody a lift. God will bless you. See you tomorrow. Bring at least one person whom you know is your friend, somebody in need. Bring them. Let them be blessed. God bless you. God bless you.